Hi guys, in this video we speak to Jill Bagbanovich, Senior Colorist the Company 3. Jill has worked on some incredible projects like the Grand Budapest Hotel, Doctor Sleep, recently Black Widow, she's also done the color of Marvel's Eternals, and she's busy finishing up The Legend of Shang-Chi. Jill, I need to tell you that a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, we had Lauren Schur. We spoke to him as well. And he had such nice things to say about working with you. So when we got this chance, I was like, that is, that's awesome. So I kind of caps it off there. You guys, literally a year apart. I think four days ago, it was a year when we spoke to Larry last. So that's that is funny. Larry and I are, are good friends. Funny enough, you're going to laugh. Larry is shooting right now and I'm actually moving houses and, and I'm staying in Larry's house right now. So I'm actually in Larry's house talking to you. <laughs> so that's probably exactly if you move to the bedroom, that's where we had our discussion. So that's, that's pretty funny. Cool. I'm just in the living room, but <laughs> that's that's actually pretty awesome. I was very cool. That's funny, yeah, right? I, I must say talking to him is quite a different experience. I think we spoke for over three hours and you could just see the passion and love that man has for his job. It was, it was so yes. cool. He really, really does. He's an artist. He's a true artist. Yeah, and Absolutely also just so knowledgeable. I mean, he knows about absolutely everything, which was so he cool. He does. It's, he's extremely smart. So, Joel, let's now, now the hard part begins. Can you, can <laughs> we ask you a few questions? First one, yes, be, of course. First one being, how did you get started? It's a long story, but yes. I mean, I'll, I'll try to uh, give you the, the basic uh, pieces to that puzzle. I'm from, I'm from Rochester, New York. So it's upstate New York. And um, I was going to college for art and physics. So I'm a painter. I do large scale oil paintings. And um, so I started, started working as an intern at Kodak because my father worked at Kodak. And he came to me and he said, you know, you're, learning a lot about art and physics. And this is a perfect kind of job that merges both of them, science and the art. And there was a space for, a, for an intern there. And um, so I started interning at Kodak and learning all about the telecine, the Avid, all the different pieces of the puzzle. I, I did R&D at Kodak, you know, comparing film and early digital. This is, we're talking now like early, well, this is 99 or cool. even earlier, 97 is actually when I started there. And um, <clears throat> so I was interning there and learning all about the technology. There was no such thing as a digital intermediate then. Nobody was actually using it in mainstream movies. So I just kind of started learning all of the technology behind it. And then um, there was an opportunity right after I graduated college to come out to LA to be an assistant on a movie that needed people who knew all of this technology because it was one of the first digital intermediates to be done for the, for the full movie. And that was, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so I came out from New York to LA and I started basically the assist. I was doing all the assist work. I was the data ops. So I ran all of the, uh, Unix script and they ran all clean film and um, scanned film. We would scan film at two frames per second off the telecine and started working there basically of getting this first DI going. Um, I wasn't the colorist on that. I was just the assist, but I was definitely, you know, learning all of the process and uh, did get to sit with Roger Deakins, which is a pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and it was his birthday yesterday. And it was. <laughs> He's amazing. He's also a legend. Uh, so just worked my way up from there. So really just one step to know that it was the right place at the right time, started learning all the technology and um, always, I'm still always learning all the technology is constantly changing. So that's part of, that's one of the fun things, but that's really how I got started. <laughs> and then, and then how did you, I've actually got five questions now, but how did you <laughs> move from that work working analog if i can call it that or working with right. film, film rather how did you end up moving to digital and then going to company three which is kind of the pioneer of of color at the moment for di yes how did that yes. happen oh my gosh so 
I've been at uh, Company Three now. It's it's about about six years I've been there. So, um, but leading all the way up back when we did Oh Brother Where Art Thou, that was at Cinesite, which was a Kodak company um, in LA, and. From when I started doing all, we would scan the film back in that day, of course. So we would digitize every frame of film and create a file that would, of course, uh, be used as our source file when we were color grading. So we used to color live off the telecine. So we'd actually load the original cut negative onto the telecine and um, color live. And it was super slow. And uh, because well, it was super slow to scan off of that, but you would basically run it like a normal telecine because that that process was already well established, you know, transferring film to video was a very well established thing back then, but turning it into film again was the tricky thing. So mm. we would look at it and we would scan everything in into the digital files. We would take those files and we use send it to a laser recorder, which would basically create a new negative. And that new negative would now be used as the source for the digital IP and IN that um, would be this basically the, the source for printing. So um, anyway, that was all of the that was all of the process that we used to go from basically film to film back then with the digital intermediate, the digital basically medium in the in the center. From there, when people started shooting more digital, we'd get these files in that were already digitized right so we didn't have to digitize we didn't have to change do that stuff and then there were other challenges of course what lookup tables what color space um a lot of the early cameras had their own challenges with with how to work with them right so we had to start dealing more with those types of issues and less things with less issues with scanning different types of film and you know that type of thing so very slowly digital acquisition started coming into the pipeline and um, we had to, you know, as we went along, make up the whole workflow as we went along. And then um, now almost everything is shot uh, digitally, acquired digitally. There are a few projects here and there that are acquired on film still, but most of the time they are uh, digital. And then going from Cinesite, I worked, went from Cinesite in the early days to, um, Technicolor. I worked at Technicolor for a long time. And that was a great place to work. And then after Technicolor, I left there and I went to Modern Video Film for a few years. And that's where I did uh, Grand Budapest Hotel with Wes Anderson. You know, we went to London for that. That was really fun. And then, um, and then I ended up coming over to Company Three. Stefan, you know, is a good friend of mine. He called me and he said, "Hey, you want to come over and work for us?" And, and I, I, you know, Company Three to me is the you know it is the pioneer for color it's the yeah. biggest in the world so i was very proud to go work to be working with that team did you did you meet um stefan on a oh brother where art thou was that where you guys met first or actually no because he he wasn't involved in that one um he was he was just starting company three at that time yeah i believe yeah. and so we were I did meet him very soon after that, though. I, I met him on what project was it? I think it was. I worked with Sean Penn on a short movie about 9/11, uh, and he's you know good friends with Stefan. So Stefan came in to supervise it, right? And uh, so I think that was well over 20 years ago. Stefan and I met each other, so we've we've known each other for a very long time. <laughs> um, that I wanna. There's something I wanted to ask you, but you're, you're a traditional painter as well. Yes. And yeah. so what I, and you work with color and your dad worked with color. So it's kind of in your DNA, which I think is cool. Um, yeah. Because that's something <laughs> in this country you don't see often. Everybody is first generation film industry people. I think I've met one person ever whose dad worked in the industry and now he worked in it. So it's cool for me to have someone that grew up and, you know, that sort of thing. But the Grand Budapest Hotel is probably like a massive painting anyway. Does your, does your work or your thought process from painting influence, especially that movie, but any of your color work? Is that, how would you, how would you say? I, I would absolutely say it does. First of all, studying painting, 
I, I studied painting in Italy um, for a semester while I was in college and that changed my outlook quite a bit on just painting in general and um, how to paint light, you know, how to paint color, how to mix color, um, you know, perceived color. So if you look outside, you see blue in the shadows and warmth in the highlights, you know, very natural things that you may not pay attention to as much every day unless you had to paint it, right? So mm. those types of things and also learning about different artists, learning about different photographers, right? Those, those types of influences still stay with me because when I'm working with people like Larry or, um, you know, so many, Gabrielle Berestein or, uh, you know, Chad Stahelski, all these guys that I get to work with are, um, are artists. They all, love painting, love photography. They've all studied all of this for their part of their craft. So since that's one of my passions, right? To be able to be inspired by painters, by photographers. And I always take a little bit of that with me whenever I'm starting a project, you know, whenever I'm starting to work on, on a show, I, I pay attention to the light. I pay attention to the color choices. You know, Wes Anderson is very, very specific about his color choices and Bob Yeoman, you know, is very experienced with lighting. So I pay attention to what they put into the frame. And, and then I look at it I'm like, okay, well they lit here and, and they darkened this area or, or whatever. I mean, how can I enhance that? How can I make that shine? How can I help, you know, refine that by following their lead? So having all of this training with, um, with painting and, and light and photography, all of that, definitely helps me communicate and speak the same language as my clients yeah I, I think that's that's a wonderful way to look at it as well because i i also like to illustrate and draw and it's definitely changed my technical view of how cameras work it's weird because you understand you can understand yeah. the camera better because you, you kind of know what you want to produce instead of just capturing something but yeah exactly. uh, let can can we talk about your process for example in pre-production how do you how do you start how do you plan how do you collaborate what is what is your process there yeah absolutely so usually i'll i'll start working with a cinematographer really early when they're in pre they're prepping the movie so they'll call me and say okay here's some ideas of some looks we got to figure out a look for the show for the movie larry and i do this a lot actually and he'll send, he'll he'll give me references or paintings or anything that he he felt represents the palette that he wants or references of other movies, you know, that uh, that he wants to be able to bring into this new movie. And so what I'll do is I'll create lookup tables. You know, I know what what camera they're going to shoot. I'll create lookup tables where he can or whoever I'm working with can use it in a test. Right. And so when they're doing a hair makeup test or doing a camera test or something before they actually start shooting, they can use these lookup tables to be able to test on set and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is reacting the way I want it to be. And, you know, this is exactly right. You know, when it's, when we're shooting outside, I want it to feel more, you know, high contrast or whatever, that kind of stuff, they can test it and see how it's reacting. And then I can go ahead and amend after that. So, you know, it's, oh, it's just fine. It's too dark or it's too desaturated or whatever. And then we can create a new LUT and then they test that again. And then that becomes the one show LUT that they use, almost like picking a film stock, right? Back in yeah. the day, you'd pick a look for your show based on the characteristics of the film stock, mm -hmm. right? So we do the same thing, but we have more controls, you know, which can, can go horribly wrong, <laughs> you know, if, if you go too far. So I've had a lot of experience making it so that we have LUTs that behave well, you know, that mm -hmm. aren't going to break anything and aren't going to, you know, work well in the daylight and break everything at night or, you know, create any kind of noise or anything. So they have to be technically sound. So I do have a large color science team that helps, you know, you know, make my, make sure my LUTs are well behaved. Yeah. <laughs> they create. So we do all of that early on before they start shooting. And then when they start shooting, you know, I can help supervise daily. So I did this on Joker for Larry, where I, for the first few weeks, just make sure that the dailies colorist and the DIT, everybody's connected and everybody's talking. And I kind of oversee that and just make sure that I'm happy with how the dailies are looking so that the cinematographer, like in this case, Larry, he could focus more on getting the show started. I talk to him too. He can go and talk to the days. We're all on the same page. Everybody's on the same page, you know, and making sure that 
what the studio and the director and everybody are seeing right in the beginning of the show is correct, right? So uh, that's, that's all in, in the very first two weeks. And then usually I let them fly away and let them go to shoot their movie. And they come back to me, uh, usually with some sort of visual effects reviews or uh, sometimes preview screenings or something after they start editing. Um, and then what happens is when I get into start the DI, I already know what it should look like because I've created the LUT. I've been in these discussions. Throughout the process, if there's anything that is a problematic scene, I usually will be in contact with the cinematographer. So they'll say, you know, this scene, um, whatever, it's coming. We, it's a day for night. So we're shooting at day. It really should be night. Just note to self, that kind of thing. And sometimes I'll color stuff before, before we get to the DI because of that. But, you know, all of that is all history for me. So when I get into the DI, it's not just starting from scratch. I've got CDLs, which are basically the color decision lists that follow along with every shot, right? Um, so the visual effects, this is also important for visual effects um, artists and visual effects vendors. They will have that one lookup table that I created. They will have the CDLs that go along with every shot. So they have a good idea of what the show should look like. So when they're creating visual effects, like when Larry and I did Godzilla, King of Monsters, that one, we already had all of the color really well set. So when they were creating all these CG characters and we get into this digital intermediate, we're doing fine tuning stuff. We're not doing very large moves so that the visual effects hold together well, you know, the way they were designed. Because if you add too much contrast or something like that to, to a visual effect, it'll tend to fall apart. So, um, meaning like the show, you know, it doesn't feel as real or, yeah. or whatever. So, so all of that whole process we set from the very beginning, it makes the end process go so much smoother. Visual effects, final DI, everybody also, which is really important, will be the director and the editors and the producers and everybody who sees everything, all the dailies, this whole long process gets very used to that look. Right. Yeah. So that's the look that they feel as the movie. So when we get into the final, everybody is not, you know, nobody's going to be surprised with how it looks, you know. So so it's a very important thing to have your colorist involved in the very beginning because it just makes everything all the it's really a communication tool to make sure everybody sees things the same way. Because yeah. you know, you can ask somebody, okay, what's your description for a bleach bypass or what's your description for high contrast or or yeah. colorful or poppy, right? Yeah. Like everybody will every say time. something different, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, like everybody will say something. Nobody describes things the same way. So you could say to the producers, oh, don't worry. The dailies look kind of low contrast and flat now, but don't worry, they're gonna have a lot of color and be poppy in the final, right? But they're used to the lower contrast. So when you start bringing in poppy colors or saturated, it's gonna feel very foreign and it's not gonna play the same way. And even sometimes when you're editing or the editors have told me that, you know, the color changes a lot, then it changes how they cut. You know, if something's going to be much darker or much brighter, you're going to see things that you might want to cut around. So all of that, the whole process, it just makes it so much smoother if I can just start from the beginning. <laughs> I, I think that's a great answer and also very useful for students to hear because, you know, people think of, of color as a post-production thing. But yeah. when it comes to, especially with uh, the CDL workflows now, it makes a lot of sense to already one, why aren't you pack, why aren't you front loading it as, as you go through? Um, right. But I also, you mentioned an interesting thing where editors change the way they edit based on color. And mm -hmm. now, now I want to bring up John, the John Wick movies, because they are basically yes. Christmas tree decorations of films, highly saturated and incredibly <laughs> quick cuts. How do you guide an eye? The editors, it's you, traditionally the editor's job, but color is such a fundamental purpose in guiding the eye across the screen. How do you, in a, in a ballistically, insanely fast edited film like that, <laughs> help tell the story and still have such a kinetic, colorful, saturated experience? Right, that's a very good question. <laughs> Because funny enough, that type of thing uh, can be very tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Dan Lauston, he shot, he shoots those things masterfully. He's a, he's a master. So that helps, right? And then Chad is also one of those, Chad's the director, Chad Stahelski, also is an artist in his own right. He definitely has a lot of background in art and photography. So both of them together are very 
fun group to be able to collaborate with. And they understand totally when I want to shape things with power windows or, you know, take the saturation down on the left side of the screen and slightly darken it, create a shadow. So your eye goes to the right, where you really want to see the contrast because something that is cutting really quick, your eye picks up contrast before it will pick up, you know, detail, right? So if you have something that's dark um, light, like so there's something backlit, you're gonna feel that motion more, right? Yeah. Or if there's something that's really, really dark, you wanna be able to brighten the action, brighten where, where you feel the most motion. So your eye will pick that up and go to it because there are some, as you know, dark scenes in John Wick where they're at night, you know, running through wherever they're running, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> and there's always a lot of practical or a lot of lighting that goes into that, of course, to be able to maintain that same kinetic energy. Like there's a lot of energy, I always say in the John Wick movies, because there's so much color and saturation and in and, and contrast of just simply contrast built into the lighting, how it was shot. And then contrast in in the actual the color at the very end too. Like there's there's no like really soft contrast in in those movies because that tends to kind of in in that case lessen the energy. If you have a softer contrast image, right, it tends to be a little bit almost like quieter music is you know yeah. it works better. You know it's the same thing. And, and so we we really do a lot of shaping with windows where we can accent sometimes we can just accent the lighting just slightly a very little bit goes a long way because because dan and chad together were very um you know cognizant of that when they were shooting and they always pick amazing locations too which is so cool it's so much fun to be able to color like you know every a concert in rome or wherever they they decide to, to shoot or a ballet theater you know all these really rich decadent places that have so much detail so what we do too is we can accent that detail like if there's you know in this big theater this big ballet theater we really make sure that we can see all of the texture of the curtains and the texture of any kind of paintings on the wall or the carvings in the ceiling all that kind of fun stuff we really find all of those little things to to bring out and almost you know, create little places for your eye, help guide your eye around the frame, you know? So uh, it's, we, we use a lot of principle, or I specifically, and I've talked to Chad and Dan about this in sessions, do a lot of the same types of compositional ideas or compositional things that are traditionally used in paintings. Like usually in a painting, you know, your eye starts at the upper left and goes across, moves diagonally and ends right almost like a z pattern mm -hmm. traditional art in art school we always learn about how to keep your eye in the frame right so we do the same thing with when we're when we're coloring same exact thing and try to not you know have your eye like end over here if the brightest thing is a lower left we just balance the frame it can still be bright but maybe something else has to be you know balanced on the other side or maybe we let it be bright because we want your eye to stay over there you know so we we play with all of that Phew. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about those films and what you're saying, because like, as you're talking, I've got one of the first lectures I ever gave was about the use of color to help tell the story in John Wick, because mm -hmm. it, that movie just, just the, it's oversaturated and overdone, but it suits the story 100%. So yeah. if you were saying? Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, it's like, it's like a fantasy in a way. Like he's just got this, you know, he's, it's like a surreal world. So the color fits it. Yeah, so if you, if you, do you ever touch the script, the script at all in, in post before you start or? Yeah, no, well, for John Wick, I didn't um, touch the script, but usually I actually work with Michael Feminari, who was a cinematographer that I did uh, Haunting on Hill House, uh, um, a whole bunch of stuff. We're doing a few new shows now, we're doing, um, uh, Midnight Mass, Midnight Club, I, him and um, Mike Flanagan is a director. I work with, with that team often. And I always read the script for, for that because those, those types of things, it's really nice for me to know what's happening, what's the mood, what's the story. And again, I work with Michael to be able to create lookup tables before he shoots, really to create that feel and that look. So I definitely uh love to read the scripts so for him specifically I, I read all the scripts sometimes i get the scripts sometimes i get the the chance to read them sometimes sometimes just we have a lot of conversations about the look and 
we talk about it, you know? So, yeah. So I like to be in, to know the, the vibe of the show for sure. I think it's, it's interesting that you said you didn't have the script script for John Wick, because I think the color was so it amplified the story so wonderfully. But did you ever struggle to balance any other colors? Because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the color comes from practical lighting that then needs to be yes. taken over by you. Did you, what, yes. what was the experience working that way, balancing it? Was there anything you struggled with? Because especially in the first one, because maybe this color didn't quite work with that one or wasn't So I actually, yeah, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, so the first John Wick, I actually didn't do. So that one wasn't me. The second and the third one I did. And I'm going to be doing the next one too <laughs> next year. It's coming out. So, um, you know, the, the, there are, there were times where we had to really kind of take away certain colors. So it didn't start to feel too messy in a way. It didn't feel too, like certain colors didn't go well together. So if we had you know, bright blues and bright yellow and a bright red, we might take that, the blue and make it more cyan, you know, to kind of fit in with how it would work well with the other colors or the, the red maybe, instead of having a blue or red, have more of a yellow red so that it, they all are more, you know, in the same family. So yeah. we did that a lot too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's interesting. I'll stop talking about John Wick in a moment. It's just that, no, it's okay. Like I, I said, love John Wick here. <laughs> it's such a it's such a cool movie to look at. Also, some of the choices in for color in the movie, like the magentas and those sorts of things, you don't see them in any other movie. Mm -hmm. That's true. The magentas, yes, the magentas. I personally love how the magenta has a lot of energy. Magenta to in in a, in the palette, right? And you don't usually see that color in in movies because a lot a lot of times it's almost too overpowering, right? Mm -hmm. But in the case of, of John Wick movies, since it does have such a high energy and it is just such a, like we have, you know, the freedom to do whatever we want. It doesn't have to be real. Like if you, if you look out at a cityscape, like this is some of the fun stuff, some of the New York big, you know, stuff. Like the last John Wick movie where we had like a lot of magenta during a car chase, we had the I think it was a Victoria's Secret sign lighting the actual road, right? Yeah. So that color, it's so much fun to be able to, to play off of it. And even like the big wide shots, we could, you know, instead of having just a, a cityscape that has just like slightly yellow or slightly green lights, we threw some magentas and blues in there to be able to give it. It just gives it so much more energy in life. We're taking certain windows and turning them from kind of a dull color to like a richer green you know you throw that green in there with some magenta and all of a sudden you have like a little bit of a color vibration going on a little mm -hmm. bit of that energy that happens and so we just will find places to be able to not draw your eye away from the the action but to be able to create to, to maintain that energy and maintain a little bit of that even that's like subliminal right that you don't even notice it's happening but you just feel it you just feel how it's it's just got that that energy. So we, we did a lot of that in those movies. Uh, if you, if you get, um, if you get footage from a cinematographer, mm -hmm. what, what are you looking for? What is, what, what do you, what do you need? I should ask what makes your life easier in, in grading? Well, usually a little history too, uh, like a history is always great. Like what are they thinking when they're starting to shoot, right? What was their inspiration? What was their, um, you know, sometimes what's the worry of the, in the show, right? What, what, what do they feel is going to be their challenge? So knowing all of that going in is super helpful. And, and that helps me kind of look out for that kind of thing, or helps me very silently and quietly just make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't pop up. Um, also knowing, of course, what kind of camera, um, uh, you know, all that type of thing. Are there going to be a lot of visual effects? That's also important to be able to get ahead of that, of all of that and make sure that I get all the correct pieces of the puzzle in line for the workflow, uh, meaning the CDLs and the lookup table and all of that. Um, you know, is it going to be going out to theatrical, own, theatrical and also home video or are there going to be many other uh, versions like you know for every one of the movies I do for Marvel they have a lot of different deliverables right so we've got 3D we've got 2D we've got EDR which is the projected uh, HDR we've got 
in HDR on glass, we've got normal 709, we've got all the different levels of all the different brightnesses for 3D. We've got 3D and laser. I mean, there's just all these are all, you know, parts of the of the delivery. So we have to make sure that everything we're doing, we we plan for that. You know, so that's important to know where it's going to be shown. And and the and the file itself, um, for example, if someone's um, <clears throat> if someone wants a, a film that's really dark and underexposed and, and that that sort of thing, how much of that do you want them to do in cam camera and how much of that do you want control over? Do you want to like a nice middle ground negative or do you want them to you to play around with something and does it limit you? Does it help you? What, what would you say? Yeah, so I usually, when I'm talking to a cinematographer, I'll usually say, um, give us a really strong middle of the road kind of negative, right? Yeah. Give us something that has the most detail. Because even if we're going for a really dark look, we can really create a really dark look with a lookup table that'll kind of, you know, compress it at the lower end, almost that S film curve, right? So you have those dark darks, but you see detail in them. That's one of the little tiny details that makes something feel really rich, right? Is to have detail in the highlights and have detail in the blacks. Even if you don't necessarily need a lot of it, it's there. So I always say, expose it for that. Give me as much information as you can. And that gives us the most freedom, right? Later on. Also mentioning that if you're gonna ever be watching anything in HDR, HDR is becoming more and more popular, right? And HDR shows everything in the highlights and everything in the blacks. In, well, not everything, but you have more range, right? And you have full control of what you want people to see, so you can, you can change it. But if you have something that is really underexposed and there's a lot of noise, digital noise, or if you're shooting on film and it's underexposed, you still have grain, that type of thing that usually tends to pop up if it's underexposed, that kind of stuff shows up more in HDR, mm. or if you have clipped highlights, right? Or you have no detail in the highlights, then that kind of thing is exposed, more, meaning shown more in, in HDR. So those types of, of media that are now, or your know, way you see things, the way that things are um, being shown now, all are very important with how you acquire the image in the very beginning. So you kind of have to think ahead. Yeah, that's, uh, I had a chat with Art Adams, a while ago from from Ari mm -hmm. and he was talking about um, how because of HDR he can more easily identify which lenses they were shot on because you can see so much more so the the idiosyncrasies of the lens are so much are amplified and easier to identify when you're watching and watching in HDR but yeah th that how does that affect grading for you then now that you've got this bigger color gambit because you're not I'm guessing we're not playing in wreck anymore we're going you know much bigger yep so how yes. does that how does that affect your approach and you know is it good to have that much more it was such a bigger <laughs> playground in the end of the yes day. right that's a good question actually because everything is changing now now that we have hdr projection which is incredible on these amazing the dolby projectors that's so beautiful but you have so much more range now I would love to color every movie in HDR first, because theoretically, if you, you start with the largest color space, right? You have the most colors that you can see in the largest color gamut and the most detail. Theoretically, it would be really great to just start coloring in that space. And now color grading is going that direction, I think. But what has to also be practical is what's going to be the first deliverable what do we need first you know what's going to go out first and and what is also kind of the norm right now the norm is is a more uh this is is a we usually color in in p3 color space for the big screen sometimes we'll color in xyz color space on the big screen but you know those are just the, the normal color spaces that we use now from there you can you know, convert to HDR. And then I have to do another color pass to be able to kind of look at, sometimes it reveals skies, like skies that were white and kind of blown out are now, you see blue or you see sky and sometimes it doesn't match anymore. So you have to go through and do a pass for that. Or from the case of John Wick, <laughs> we actually looked at it and um, they have so many bright lights and they have so many beautiful sets that 
things, you know, or they, we'd have to go through or TV screens, we'd have to go through and match them again because all of that stuff is a very, very high end yeah. that you can't see unless you're in HDR. So theoretically, it'd be cool to be able to just do the biggest color space and then drive everything from that. We're not quite there yet because simply the HDR, not every movie has an HDR deliverable. There's not enough screens out there. And of course, because of COVID, everything has changed a bit. And, you know, obviously theaters are, you know, just starting to reopen here and, and that type of thing. But, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that all kind of moves forward. And, you know, if it changes, we were going that way before COVID a little bit stronger, a little bit faster pace, but now I think it's slowed down a little bit because it's simply just the lack of theaters being open. Um, but, you know, even even for all the Netflix stuff that I'm doing, Netflix shows, those shows I color first in HDR, which okay. is very cool. Yeah. yeah. So I did like Umbrella Academy. Um, I did the first two seasons. I'll start up the third season soon. That one and uh, any others like that will basically colored first in HDR. So you colored in the largest color space. And then we derived the 709 from that. And that works really well because the 709 pass is pretty easy at that point because yeah. you've already gone through and matched everything outside of its range. So it just, you know, kind of falls in pretty nicely. That That's now the normal workflow for, for HDR shows. I just had like an Eureka moment with that answer. So <laughs> thank you. That's, I think that'll, yes. that'll help me in the future. Um, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, COVID, how is COVID go? Well, I actually want to know how HDR TVs are selling there by you because we don't really see them on our side at all. Um, I was going to ask you that question. How is it there for, uh, for, for movie theaters or HDR TVs or anything like that? No, no <laughs> HDR in movie theaters. We do have sets for sale, but they are very, very limited and very, very outpriced. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, not many. And I think our, our rollover to HDR is going to be about two, two or three years longer to get that to that saturate, consumer saturation point than you guys are going to mm -hmm. and for, mm -hmm. for, for many reasons but that's 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 how that is the theaters are open but attendance is low people are still very very, very mm -hmm. par paranoid actually i had a conversation with one of the managers from one of our theaters the, um, they took they took the opportunity to actually redo the theater to do renovations because of because of COVID, they were going to do it anyway but they just now that everything's closed it's it's less of a less of a financial burden on them because they, they were going to be closed anyway so yeah. that, that's one thing um yeah how how was how was working under COVID for you and also how how is it now that theaters are opening do you find yourself with too much work all of a sudden or <laughs> is it at least a little balanced out it has been extremely busy um, for me. Um, I just, I finished Black Widow, um, a Marvel movie. It's coming out in July. Um, I finished that during COVID, all remotely. So I've been working remotely, um, sometimes from home. Sometimes I'd go into the theater for Black Widow. I had to be in a theater, mm. um, but it was very strict. You know, nobody else was allowed in the theater. Of course, all, you know, all the protocols were in place where I had my temperature taken and the masks and all the things, but um, we, and we set it up remotely so that the clients were in another theater and they would basically just be seeing my uh, same exact setup. They have a, the same projector, same setup. They were over on the Disney lot, you know, everything's basically connected. So we would just route my signal over to them I'd have them on the phone and we'd be watching the same thing. And so that's how we finished Black Widow. And then we did all the different uh, video versions and HDR and all of that kind of thing remotely the same way. So, so that actually was quite successful. Um, I've done quite a few commercials, quite uh, the TV shows. When I finished uh, Umbrella Academy, the second season, I finished all of that remotely. You know, when COVID hit, everything kind of stopped down. We had to kind of assess the situation and see how we we're going to handle it. Company three ramped up very quickly <laughs> and got um, the tool stream box and Clearview Flex out to our, us uh, getting everything put together so that we could stream to people's computers, iPads very quickly and easily um, to be able to have sessions. So, you know, we all connect via Zoom. So I'll be on a Zoom link so I can talk or see people. A lot of times in a dark room. So I just, you know, talk to people anyway without the video. But, 
I would go ahead and, and be able to stream things out and, and make sure that they were happy with the color. And we go through all the calibration with the iPads and, and computers so that everybody was seeing things in about the right way and, and run sessions from there. And I mean, I just did, I'm just finished. I just started um, about midway through another Marvel movie, uh, The Eternals. And we did all of that remotely. We had that whole team uh, in different theaters, everybody, you know, there's limited limits to how many people can be together, right? So I would be alone in my theater, send it over to their theaters over in the Disney lot and um, be on the phone and we would work together. So that's, that's how we have been doing it. And now just, just slowly, now that there's been vaccinations and slowly things are opening up a little bit, that, that kind of thing is, is now uh, allowing it to be a little, a little bit less strict, but we're still working remotely and being very careful. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you think the changes that came from COVID that are going to stay? Or? I think so. I think, you know, honestly, being able to have this flexibility. So if, if a cinematographer is working in London or Australia or South Africa, anywhere, <laughs> right, then they can easily, I can send some things and, and we can look at the same images. And even if it's on an iPad, it's, you know, a good communication tool. And then they can do the, if they want to come into the theater and do the final review, then it's, it's less time. They don't have to go somewhere all the time. Yeah. So I think it's going to, that's going to stick yeah. and visual effects reviews too, or uh, any of that kind of stuff. It's an e it's a nice communication tool, getting things started, do a remote session and here, here's what I was thinking with this and this and this. Am I on the right direction? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's continue that direction. It's, it's, it's a nice communication tool. I think that's definitely going to stay for sure. Um, I have to, I actually want to, to let the students ask a few questions if that's fine. But before we of do, course. I need to talk about Joker a little bit based on the yes. conversation <laughs> we had with Larry, because he had such a nuanced and full understanding of that film. I mean, he was just telling us about one shot and he went down from the broader sense into the mi most minute little detail. Um, but for that film, they shot it on the Alexa 65, which mm -hmm. massive sensor. I don't know if there's any color. There are probably some color challenges working with that. But also, um, I saw somewhere that you worked with your dad to develop a lot mm -hmm. to match that 70s king of comedy look that they were going for how yes. how was that experience working with your dad and then also yeah. working, working with someone so i don't want to i don't want to call him obsessed but so uh, someone so detail oriented like larry on something like that yeah larry's very detail oriented i mean larry and i have known each other and worked together since 2005 or so so i i, I know if i'm if i'm guessing dukes of hazard yeah yes. mentioned exactly that. Yeah. You did. Yeah. So I have a full understanding of how detailed he can get about things and, and trying to understand what, um, you know, what is important to him and what do I have to make sure I look out for and how do I protect the image and make sure that we get all those little pieces of the puzzle that he was looking for. Right. So, you know, um, for Joker, I think that it was very important for that story to have a filmic look. Right. And so Larry called me and said, listen, you know, I'm shooting some film tests. I'm shooting a couple of different cameras. This is pre-production. You know, can you make digital look like film? I was like, <clears throat> OK, so, yes, we have a lot of different lookup tables already at Company 3. But specifically for the stock around that time, we really wanted this 5293, 5298, which were very popular, um, you know, around the late 70s, early 80s. And those were Kodak stocks, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Those are Kodak stocks. Yep. And um, so looking at that, I was thinking, okay, who better to call in on this than my dad? So my father, Mitch Bogdanowitz, is um, he used to work for Kodak. He's retired now, but still does a lot of freelance work. But, you know, he, it helped design film stocks and is very, very knowledgeable about film. And um, I actually worked with him back at Cinecite. So in the very beginning of Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? When we were starting the DI, I'm going to kind of go on a little tangent and I'll get back, I promise. <laughs> but when we were starting, yeah, yeah. 
when we were starting the DI for Oh Brother, we were coloring on a CRT, an, a CRT monitor, which is not very big. I forget the exact dimensions, but we were looking at an anamorphic image on a CRT monitor that was maybe 18 inches wide, right? It was small. And then we were just starting to use an ICC profile on the monitor, which is basically like a lookup table, right? To be able to color through. And then we would put it out onto film using the film recorders and it would come back and certain colors would be wildly different because on Oh Brother, we took the trees and <clears throat> not me specifically, the main colorist, Julius Freed, and took the uh, greens that were shot in Louisiana in the summer with super rich greens and he would key them and turn them into more of a brownish gold color because that's kind of a feel. They wanted old postcard feel for the home movie, right? So funny enough, that color, that kind of gold greenish color is a very tough color to make back on film mm. because, you know, when you're looking at an ICC profile, certain colors that are outside of gamut and will kind of basically surprise you on film because film had a larger color gamut. That's a nice way to put it. Right? <laughs> so my dad, I was working at Cinesite and he was still working at Kodak. And so I called him, I'm like, we're running into this problem. We just can't get this to match. And so you would bring one, we do all these film tests and bring one color in and then the next color would pop out, right? And so it was just unpredictable. And so he gave me thousands of color charts to read <laughs> and color chips to read off of the monitor. And then we, he designed lookup tables to be able to help predict that. And then we moved to a projector. We got a projector on that show, mid show. And we also calibrated that projector and made a lookup table for that. So it became a work in progress as we were going through, we were solving these issues that kept popping up. And then we would, you know, uh, create new lookup tables to be able to help predict that. And still, there were still some surprises on film because, you know, we hadn't predicted all of this happening. But so that whole thing, we, I worked with my dad starting back then solving all these issues so moving forward while he was at Kodak and I was at Cinecite because I was at Cinecite for a little over six years anytime we run into any of these problems and this is the very beginning of DI right so there were a lot of problems and a lot of surprises and so he was the go-to really figuring all that out so when so I know how brilliant he is and how he can solve all these problems, right? And how he has a very solid understanding of film and digital and the issues that happened when you try to merge them. So when Larry came to me and said, we need to try to make it look like film, I started looking at some of our film lookup tables that we had at Company 3, which are great, but not exactly what I was looking for. And then he actually shot some film stock specifically on the stairs, the famous stairs, right? Yeah. Where he really wanted like that film cyan and that film yellow and the highlights, it's super rich, right? And he's like, I need this color separation, like what film has. I'm like, all right, well, see what we can do. So um, I called up my dad and I said, listen, we need a, a film look like this. And company three uh, allowed me to hire him in to be able to do that. and. We worked together and created this look where I actually took the film footage that they shot and I took the um, stuff from the Aries 65, all of that same footage that Larry shot and used this lookup table and matched it. Now there's another whole part of this equation, which is texture. So we also added grain, right? Using live grain, we use that, that uh, program, live grain, it's a third party program. And it's amazing, by the way, it creates depth with grain. So just like film does, film has different levels of grain, right? On different layers of different colors. So say you've got a person of flesh tone with like a, a darker background, that background will have more grain and that flesh tone will have less grain. So very subtly it, it creates a depth. Yes. So we used that uh, also um, in the test to be able to match that film stock. So so you know using my dad's lookup table, we went back and forth a little bit to refine it. And to really make it work and um and then basically add that grain and i sent back some some tests to larry and todd and it was a go they're like yep there we go this is the look that we want so that's how that was all created yeah and i think if you know just, just from my conversation with larry getting the thumbs up to achieve that i think is high praise because yes I mean, he's got a very particular <laughs> thing that he wanted to do um oh huge 
last question and then i'm going to let let the students ask you some questions but do you have any tips for coloring for the alexa mini well the alexa is one of my favorite cameras because it's got a sensor that has the most color depth to me um color depth is something really important when you go into color right so even if you're not going for a really saturated look there's very subtle skin tones or very subtle um gradations of blue and sky or all the things that you want to see the most detail in right all of that is super important when you're getting into color so uh the the you know alexa mini has a nice lookup table kind of as the basic rec 709 mm -hmm. that comes out of camera and it, it's got just a beautiful color depth i mean of course i always say expose right down the middle get the most detail and um you know i've created quite a few lookup tables for for airy and um that always can push it and pull it around and make it look really cool and it holds up really beautifully so the recommendation is yes shoot shoot that <laughs> <laughs> and and uh you'll get some beautiful images yeah. that's that's good to know our our third years are shooting the graduation movies on the mini and mm -hmm. graders obviously need to grade it. Unfortunately, we've only got one colorist, so she's got quite a challenge. Oh my gosh. Um, yes, yeah, very busy. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so if we've got someone coming in. Does, guys, does anybody have any questions for Jill? Now is your chance. Caleb, let's hear it. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Jill. Hi, Caleb. Um, uh, I'm looking at your resume on the internet and I see a lot of forms and I just want to know how did you feel when um, you won when you won for um, outstanding grading and color for Joker oh, I'm sure you thanks. must have felt very nice yeah I was very very honored um, to, to win for that because to have to have my whole community, all of my peers recognize my work, uh, it was it was a huge honor, and especially my work with Larry Shear, who was a dear friend of mine. Um, you know, it really it really touched my heart, and it was really made me very very honored. And the twenty years or so that I've been doing this uh, made it all of the background, all of that hard work, it was all recognized. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Mr. Smith, of course you do. <laughs> uh, hi, ma'am. Um, Hello. I just want to, I just want to know. Ma'am said something about the lot that is created before the time, and I just don't understand that. I thought the you, you color it or do that lot after the things are already recorded. So could ma'am just elaborate on that yeah so um i actually create a lot usually before they shoot that way that lot that i create can actually be put in the camera and then when they're on set and they're shooting and they're looking at their monitors off of the camera they can actually see that lot that i created and actually light to it so it's very important for them to know how the contrast and the colors and everything work with that LUT in the camera so that when they're shooting, they can actually see what, what it's going to look like. So I do all the tests before they start shooting with them. They usually do camera tests or hair and makeup tests. So I usually work with them then to create the look and to create the LUT. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Amanda. Hi. Okay. Hi. So I wanted to ask, what is your favorite uh, genre to work with, if you do have one? And uh, what do you think is the most, like, colorable genre to work with? Colorable. Or the most favorite, your, yeah, your most favorite one. Sure. So that's an interesting question, because I think my favorite genres or my favorite kind of films to work on are the ones that allow the color to help tell the story, right? So Joker had a very specific feel and I love to be able to help, you know, enhance that feel with the color. And same thing for like a Grand Budapest Hotel, it's a very different type of movie for sure. 
but I loved also that one because it had a very strong color um, character. When the color becomes a character or becomes a feel, that's those are my favorites to work on. So maybe that. So there's not specific type of show, but it's a specific role that my uh, that my color plays. That those are always my favorite. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome, Ethan. Hi there. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. Hi, um, my pleasure. He's gonna be a politician when he grows up. <laughs> I <hope> so. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Um, I just want to know, since you said that you've been really inspired by photographers and artists, um, as well as you've done art, what's your, what's been your biggest inspiration throughout your whole career? Biggest inspiration, I think, well, it's interesting. I think when I lived in Italy and I was surrounded by art all the time, whether it be the architecture or um, museums or paintings or you know, just being surrounded by a whole culture of art really changed how I saw things. And there's certain, I have so many favorite artists, it's hard to just name one, but, um, but I, but there's certain uses of color that always stand out to me. There's a uh, French painter named Emile Nolde that does these incredible watercolors. Typically, when you think of a watercolor, you think of it as kind of more soft, muted colors. And, and that is not the case with this guy. And it, just crazy reds and blues and the way they mix without getting muddy always made me really just inspired and thinking, okay, well, you don't have to be safe with color, you know, or throwing in, never using black when you paint, which is actually one of the rules or one of the big uh, things that that a lot of very traditional painters did. Never use a straight black, you always mix color into it, right? Or create depth. And one of the ways you create depth in a painting that's not moving is to create, to throw color in to the shadows or into the highlights. And so I take that with me when I'm coloring for movies. So all of that is very inspiring to me. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. You're very welcome. To Kanye. Hi, so hi, Joe. Um, my question hey. is, yes, um, how does the location influence your color choices for a project? Um, specifically how you choose to maybe emphasize or focus on the details and how you want the viewer and the eye of the viewer to um, take in all of that, if I'm making sense. Sure. So like location, meaning like where they're shooting, that type of thing. So, so yeah. So if yes, somebody- Yes, along with how it's- um... I see. So if somebody's shooting in a city, so, so like no, New York just... City. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you can go on. I'm sorry. I think my internet is lagging. It's okay, it's okay, no problem. But um, I'll continue. I'll just, so if somebody is shooting in a city, you know, and they want really graphic, really strong lines to be able to, you know, accentuate the architecture, then that is very telling to me about where I'm gonna put my contrast, you know? If somebody's shooting in Australia and they really wanna feel that red dirt or um, in a blue sky to create that color contrast, would be more important. So whenever um, I'm, I'm looking at where they're shooting and what story they're trying to tell, I, I definitely, it, it informs me how I'm gonna create or recreate that feel. So hopefully that answers a little bit of your question. <laughs> I think it does, shame. Inter South African internet's notorious. Thank you so much, that was very really hard for dropping you <laughs> in trouble when you don't need it. Um, <laughs> um, hi again. Hi. Um, so you've done a lot of films and obviously they span over a number of genres. Um, and obviously each one of those genres have a specific conventional um, color grading. Comedy has its light, its light tone. Um, horrors have their darker tones. 
Do you ever play with the conventions and try to blur the lines or perhaps just try to bring a different feel, an unconventional feel to a film? Yeah, actually, um, when uh, Larry and I worked on Hangover 2, which is a comedy, right? We didn't go for just the basic, bright, super colorful comedy. We kept it very filmic and we let it go dark and let it go gritty here and there. And so it, that is one of the projects that I can think of right off the top of my head that does kind of not fit the, the normal mold of a comedy, you know? But yeah, absolutely. It depends on the vision of the creatives. I'm here to support it. If they, if they want to try to blur the lines a little, I'll definitely help that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I think The Hangover is a very underrated movie as to how unique it was in the way it was styled. So that that's that's a cool thing to bring up. I think for a film school, The Hangover is maybe a one to go have a look at again. Um, yeah. Who else? Uh, Mr. Smith, did you have your hand up? Have you asked a question yet? Uh, yes, I will have another question. I, I asked this. I asked this question earlier to Mr. Tate, but he didn't answer me. He didn't give me the answer I wanted because I did not. I'll take. I'll take How it. Dare you? Yeah. Because I did not. <laughs> because I did not ask the question properly. Maybe okay, but I wanted to know. And after third year degree, is it strong enough to gain the respect of a high company? Uh, international company would it get me that interview or is there some more steps that I need to get that interview interview for well that's interesting one of the things that um, that I noticed with a lot of people that are in my industry the top people is that they are always learning and they're always striving for something bigger and better and learning more right so if if you're asking with a third level like a third year degree will that get you an interview what's going to get you the interview is yes the degree and all of your uh all of your experience that you can bring to the table but it's going to be your work ethic and the work ethic with a lot of people in hollywood is extremely strong and because it can be very, it's very competitive, as you know, and it's very, uh, you know, it's hard. There's many long hours. Like I will work a 16 hour day and sleep for a few hours and get up and do it again. Sometimes that's just what it takes when you take on the responsibility of a show. And the same thing with cinematographers, Larry, or any of the other cinematographers or directors that I work with, they will work very, very long days and for months and months on a time. So to get you interviews yes the degree is good but as much experience real life experience it can bring to the table is is huge as well and even your uh, initiative or how many projects have you done on your own you know how many things have you uh produced or or shot or written or shown your passion for the medium that that always gets you noticed does that answer your question so the answer <laughs> so the answer is yes they would Give you the interview with your degree but it's your work that would get you the job so they would yeah. give you a chance they would give you the chance if you have the degree i think so but you know it's also interesting is you know everybody has gotten into this industry in a different way right cinematographers always i know a lot of cinematographers who went to cinematography school and all of that and you make a lot of connections there you make a lot of uh, you learn a lot about how to do it. So that's definitely a great, a really great uh, base, but you definitely need to just get out there and just start doing it. Whether, you know, would I, even if you don't have a lot of uh, money or, or any of that, just get your, your group together of people from film school and just make it, just work, just make it happen. That I'm telling you is, is the biggest thing. Mr. Okay. Smith, I think cool. you were right. Her answer was better than mine. The degree is there. <laughs> it's a small part of the puzzle, but at the end of the day, it's up to you. Um, right. Yeah. Mr. Radford. Cool. 
Hi, Jill. Thanks so much Hi. for taking the time to uh, chat with us. So earlier you mentioned um, like how when you're chat like working with people remotely, like there was like calibrating of iPads and that sort of thing. So my question would be like with us, you know, not really having budget for things like uh, Flanders scientific monitors, you know, those mm -hmm. kind of those kind of things. Um, like I struggle personally a lot where like I'll have a dull monitor and I will uh, do my grade on that and then I will send it off to someone else who has a Apple monitor and they just don't match up. So what would your recommend recommendation be for like, you know, someone who can't really um, get like these very high end monitors um, to get like accurate color? Um, how, how do we kind of get get around that? Uh, well, that's a that's a big issue for a lot of people, um, and even even a lot of the clients that I'm streaming to, uh, it's I've had people on different types of monitors or like stream it to their TV and saying it doesn't look the same as as something else. It's just a big problem uh, mm -hmm. in in the world. So funny enough, I find iPads are pretty solid. Okay, <laughs> iPads, awesome. funny enough, are a really good guide. So if you if you have an iPad or if you have an Apple mon Apple tends to be pretty solid with with yes. their calibration. So yeah, they tend to say I think they say like at least a recent one seems to be they say like they're calibrated for P three. Um, it can it be yeah they are okay. The, the, that's, the new, that's very cool. The one with the new processor is calibrate calibrated for P three color space, which I found very interesting. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And they can do HDR as well, but not a full HDR. HDR usually goes to about a thousand nits brightness, and they can get around six hundred and fifty to seven hundred brightness. But you know, um, so it's not full HDR yet. But it's that is Apple is really good with their calibration. So I would say match your Dell to the Apple because it's pretty close to seven hundred nine standard. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome, Megan. Hello, hi, Jill. Hi. Hi. Um, I am an extremely large fan of Wes Anderson's work in general and the Grand Budapest Hotel and all of that. And I studied production design, so set design. And um, yeah, color for me is one of my absolute favorite things ever. And um, <laughs> I just wanted to hear about your relationship with the set designers and set design in general, a bit more about that. And yeah, just how that looks for you and what you're doing versus what they're doing. Absolutely. That's a good question. Um, so I don't usually interface directly with the set designers. So it's usually the cinematographer director type of thing happens. And um, so they usually get a very similar direction that I get. It's funny, though, it would make sense that we would talk more, but it doesn't usually happen that way. Usually it's through the director or the cinematographer, but it is a very large part of what I do. So I take what they do in um, production design and, and enhance it for the lack of a better word. So uh, for Wes Anderson's movie that I did, that one, he has a very strong sense. He's, he's very involved with set design. He's very involved with the color. So he, um, he directs the production designer and then I kind of pick it up from there and, and we enhance it from there. Now there's another one I'm doing right now. I'm finishing um, a show for, it's gonna be on Disney plus called the Mysterious Benedict Society. And it is very Wes Anderson like with a lot of the production design. You'll probably love it. Very cool production design, very cool colors. And I colored it in that same way as the Wes Anderson style which has got a lot of that color separation and really poppy colors and so you know i i love when we have a production designer that that is bold and helps tell the story of course create mm -hmm. the world and i just basically take take it at the very tail end and take it from there and enhance it and make sure everything you know it may and maintain that vision awesome thank you so much <laughs> you're welcome richard Oh, um, can you can you guys hear me? Sorry. 100%. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, this might be quite a silly question because um, I've come off from a writing background, but I recently got into um, CG, and, um, CG regarding modeling, uh, 3D modeling and animation from a hobby perspective. Um, how does that, um, it, how does that work in regards to 
color grading, would um, the animators grade it as they render it? Or would you guys, for example, um, grade the animators footage? I don't know if you've had experience with it after they've rendered it and sent it to you guys for editing and so forth. That's not a, it's not a silly question um, because yes, the animators do color it as they're going along, but there's many animators, right? It's not just one person. So they all are doing their own thing. It's usually pretty controlled, but when it gets to the final stage, it's about smoothing it out. It's about, um, you know, making sure that uh, everything matches the way it should. And it's about, you know, also maintaining that same look going out all, to all the different venues. So HDR, theatrical, 3D, all of that needs to be controlled through the colorist. So at that point, the colorist is a little bit more of a technician dealing with the, uh, all of the, um, you know, uh, all the animation stuff. Thank you. Much appreciated. Welcome. Sure. R Russ, do you have a question out of Vietnam? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hi, Joe. Thanks so much for, for talking with us. Uh, one of my favorite series all time is Haunting of Hill House. I think it's amazing. And then uh, I started watching Doctor Sleep. And before I even realized it was also Mike Flanagan, I instantly was like this, you know, it's very much like Haunting of Hill House and all that. So I guess I was kind of wondering, uh, like, how much of an input from the color side did you have there? Or was that more Mike Flanagan's vision? Or was it something you more uh, discussed to, together? And uh, like Richard, I also am from a writing background. Like, so what, like, was there like thoughts of color going into the writing process, maybe? Or can you maybe put some light on that? Sure. Yes. Um, that is uh, my, that's Mike Flanagan and Michael Feminari that I did both of those projects with. And yeah, I designed that lookup table for them before they shot. I read the script for both of those things and designed those lookup tables based on, you know, what I was thinking and worked with Michael Fuminari to really kind of refine that. And um, I don't know if the color kind of played into the writing. I mean, um, Flanagan is brilliant and he uh, creates his own world, you know, when he's writing stuff. But I think it's a little bit, it's, it's not as much in the writing, but it's definitely a part of the whole project. And I, I interpret it too. Like I'll read the script and I'll interpret it. Like I felt like, you know, Hill House, we have a very limited palette except for the red door, you know? Yeah. And then <laughs> Dr. Sleep was very similar because we wanted it to kind of feel filmic, you know, and, and be not the same as The Shining, but have the same kind of thread, you know? And um, a, a filmic feel in a way and and also have that creepy feel because it's a very creepy movie so so yeah designed everything with them early on for sure okay thank you so much you're very welcome thank you pk you've had your hand up for a while i'm so sorry uh no no it's fine so so uh, i kind of just want to ask jill this one question it's a it's a very short question i'm surprised it didn't come up yet um, but uh, Jill, what is your favorite color? <laughs> That's, funny. That's funny. That is, it depends on, on the day, but um, I love like a good cyan, like a green blue is always like one of my favorites for sure. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. That's all I wanted to know. You're welcome. You're Thanks. Welcome. Thanks for that one. <laughs> Nate, does your yeah. still have a question? Yeah, hi, sir. Yeah, please. <laughs> Go for it. Hey, how's it going, Joe? Good, very good. Oh, sweet. I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm like a working DIT, and I wanted to know um, what the role is in your mind of a DIT on set and what their function is and what you expect from them, like when it comes to you from, from sets. That's a very good question. So I work with a lot of DITs. Um, so usually when I'm creating lookup tables, um, I will be sending them to the DITs to be able to show to the cinematographer on set. And I get a lot of feedback from DITs. I work with them, you know, often. So they say, oh, well, like I'm consistently making the CDL brighter or I'm consistently making it darker or whatever. You know, I can, I can change the lookup table based on some of that feedback. And, um, you know, I expect basically from a DIT to just make sure we all communicate. It's kind of 
very simple. Like we're all very important parts of the process and DIT is super important to make sure that everything is set up correctly on set and that we have all the detail and the highlights and all the detail and the blacks and making sure that everything is exposed or, you know, any of the technical issues would not be a problem, you know? Uh, hold on a second, my dog is barking. Come here, I come here. <laughs> My dog decided to, to speak up when the gardeners came. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, just the DIT, just make sure we're all on the same page and make sure that uh, that we can communicate about a lookup table and CDLs and all that good stuff. That'd be cool, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I've got one last question and then, then I'll let you go. And thank you so much for your time. Sure. Everybody, everybody's been super engaged. This <laughs> a sign that has gone super well. Um, <laughs> yes, but Ross brought up brought up Doctor. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, Ross, Ross brought up Doctor Sleep, and I I love that movie. The color I think it's is amazing. But then Thank also, you. also it's living up to a Kubrick movie. Now it doesn't yes. it doesn't look like the original Shining mm -hmm. for certain places, but I'm sure that would have been something that went through your mind when you were preparing to color Dr. Sleep. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. There are certain parts of The Shining that we wanted to really kind of match, like the hotel, everything in the hotel, right? And so all of that, we really wanted to kind of keep the same colors. The carpet color is very iconic. Um, colors in, in certain rooms in the hotel, right? Were very, very important. So actually match we actually referenced the original shining for those specific practical things right because they're iconic yeah. so we made sure that those matched extremely well and um you know all of that kind of thing we really wanted the audience to be connected to that hotel feel those colors that you remember from the shining and uh, even though the hotel is is years later and it's you know aged but still keep that that connection was very important. That's a good question. Did did you reference it from um, original film prints or just just from the from the film itself? Mm -hmm. We actually got some archives from Universal. We actually got some of the original, um, wow. you know, remastered, um, basically remastered. But it was all on. Uh, I believe it was eight, we had some HDR in seven seven oh nine that was actually matched to the original prints. When they actually did the remaster so it was a pretty accurate color representation okay that's yeah that that's awesome and i guess it would also match on the when the new blu-ray comes out now you can put them back yeah back to back yeah and that's if, right if, if you're only matching like you're matching the overlook hotel but you've got a whole mm -hmm. new movie happening on on the other side how do how do those two interact in your mind when it comes to choosing the colors for for the part we've never seen before Exactly. So that's one of the things, one of the reasons we kept a really filmic look. And um, so we had a very similar contrast, a very similar feel, the S curve of the film, all of that we wanted to keep going. So it didn't feel like you jumped to a new movie when you got inside the hotel. So it's all about how to, you know, smoothly transition from um, new to the old. Yeah. I think you, yeah. you did a masterful job. I enjoyed that movie so, so, so much. Um, so I'm glad Ross brought it up to think about it. Jill, yes. I just want to say thank you. This was awesome. And you. if, if you're ever in South Africa, let us know. Please come visit our campus. We'd love to show you around. We'd love to show you some of the students' work. We also have a really nice local beer down the road. So be great. To <laughs> see All the best. Can't wait for Black Widow. And thank you so much for your time again. These things make such an impact on the students. It's really, really appreciated. Well, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everybody for coming. And, you know, best of luck to all of you and all of your projects. And maybe we can all collaborate someday. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jill. Have a lovely day. And in all right, you. say hi to thank the garden. You, everybody. <laughs> I know. <laughs> all right. Bye, you guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much, Jill. Uh, thanks so much.